State of Ohio Plaintiff v. George Washington, Flag No. 4, Case No. 2018, CR 155. We begin another day of trial. We've convened here in the absence of the jury, for now at least, and the jury will be brought up in a few minutes. The defendant is present in court today with his attorneys, John Parker and Richard Nash, and the State of Ohio is represented by Prosecuting Attorney Rob Junk and Special Prosecuting Attorneys Angela Canepa and Andrew Wilson. Ryan Scheider of the Ohio BCI and I is also present. Today we are to have opening, excuse me, closing arguments of counsel with the jury present, of course, for that. I'm not sure whether there's anything else that we need to put on the record before we have the jury brought up. Is there anything on behalf of the State? Anything? No. We have nothing, Your Honor. Anything on behalf of the State? Nothing. All right. The court, the record will reflect that the court has given counsel for each side some proposed jury instructions here. Well, actually, a draft of jury instructions, which will be our instructions, unless there's something that comes up that will require a change in that, and also some jury verdict forms for counsel to review. We will bring the jury up then. Jason. You may be seated. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. It's good to see you all here as we begin another day of trial in this case. We have reached the point at which counsel for each side will be giving closing arguments. Before we begin that, however, I will inform you now that the court has granted a motion dismissing specifications 4, 5, and 6 to counts 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. Now, those first eight counts were aggravated murder counts. The charges remain, and the other specifications as to those counts, that's specifications 1, 2, and 3 remain. However, specifications 4, 5, and 6 to those first eight counts were what are referred to as death specifications. And that means that the death penalty 
um, is no longer uh, possible in this case uh, and uh, that you will not be sequestered. All right. Um, now, is counsel for the state ready to give closing argument this time? Yes, sir. Is the defense ready to give closing yes. argument? All right. Ladies and gentlemen, closing arguments of counsel are designed to persuade. Closing arguments of counsel in and of themselves uh, are, uh, are not evidence, and, uh, but, are, uh, but each side will uh, argue uh, uh, what they feel that you should find the evidence has shown. All right, the state may give closing argument. to first of all start by thanking each and every one of you. Um, you guys have probably served, at least as far as I know, the longest of any criminal jury anyhow. And what's, what's in addition to that is each of you have paid strict attention every time you've been in the courtroom. And I know we've tried your patience um, with all the stops and starts, especially the stops, and there was a lot of dead days and dead time. And we apologize for that as the court said. A lot of times there's things that we need to take care of that doesn't involve the jury, and so that's how we end up handling that. So we started this back in July when it was we were in that sweaty gymnasium without any air conditioning, and here we are, um, you know, shivering when we walk outside. So, um, and I also want to, you know, just apologize for the enormous amount of evidence in this case, right? Um, obviously, when you have eight victims instead of just one victim, you have eight autopsies and, and all that follows there. And if you have four crime scenes instead of one, then you have all of that. And I kind of talked about that in opening statement, but um, I think you now have a, a better appreciation for exactly how immense the evidence is this. Now is the time um, for you guys to do the work, right? Um, you're going to be hearing closing arguments this morning. Um, and, and probably into this afternoon, um, probably tomorrow, the court will give you the instructions of law that you will use to apply to the facts. As the court said, nothing that I say, nothing that the attorneys for Mr. Wagner say are evidence. And specifically, if I say something that does not ma match or meet your recollection of what the evidence was in this case, the court will tell you to rely on your collective. So I'm not purposely trying to misstate anything. Um, in fact, I try to purposely state it cor as correctly as I can. But again, if I say something that you're like, oh, that's not how I remember it, again, the, the court will be instructing you that you have to rely on your collective memories, okay? Also, the court is going to instruct you that you will have access to all of the evidence in this case that has been admitted. Um, you know, things like um, these items that Ms. Elliott from BCI testified to as far as the shoe evidence, the shoes themselves, um, this big item that she prepared with the overlay, um, the concrete buckets and all the contents of that. However, it will be kept under lock and key upstairs on the third floor, so if you are in the deliberation room and you want to see some evidence, then you will be instructed to let the court staff know and they can bring that down so that you guys can look at whatever you want, okay? Um, you should have, when you first retire, you should have things like this, photographs and various documents and such. Um, that'll, be, that'll fit readily into the jury room, and so it will give you as much of that stuff as we can. But again, if you want to see some physical evidence or you want to listen to an audio um, tape or one of those videos um, that really weren't videos, but um, audios, um, then just let court staff know and they will make sure to accommodate you. Not that you necessarily have to do that. I don't want you to feel like you have to. Obviously, you saw the evidence as we presented it in the courtroom, but there might be certain items that you want to, to go back to. At the beginning of this trial, one of the things I remember saying to you is that 
these murders should never have happened, that there was not a reason for these murders to happen. And I think now um, you can appreciate what I meant by that, the senselessness of these murders that happened on suspicion, uh, no, no, no evidence, no information that any of the victims in this case did anything untoward. And half of them, at least, were killed simply because they were there. I want to go back to the victims now and start, because that's where we kind of started this, and I just want us to keep in mind why we are here, right? We are here because eight innocent victims were slaughtered, most of them in their sleep, all of them unarmed and unsuspecting that anything was afoot. Frankie Roden, um, 20 years old, uh, with his son, his two sons, there with Hannah Hazel. We've heard a lot about his derby car racing. Um, You know, he loved his children, he loved his derby car racing, he loved his fiance, um, he had just started a new job, he, uh, working for a former teacher of his, um, basically on, you know, just at the brink of beginning the rest of his life, right? We knew that um, he liked hunting, apparently chicken fighting as well, but we also knew that he was not, um, a drinker, uh, and he definitely was not involved in any of the marijuana business, right? We heard testimony that Chris Sr. was very particular about that, did not want any of his children involved in it, did not want them to use it either. And we know that he didn't, right? We know that none of them did because we have autopsy toxicologies that show that. Um, Frankie's crime for which he got the death penalty was allegedly kissing his niece on the lips. That's the only thing that anybody said about him. That and the fact you heard from the defendant himself that Frankie was the type of man that you would have to go through to get to his family. So again, that whole, if he knows, if he's left alive, he would figure it out and possibly seek vengeance. <coughs> and that,
continue with it. Okay. Um, Anna Hazel, um, Gilly, very proud of her son, her six month old son. Um, she and Frankie and Ruger shared a home together. They have just taken that home over from um, Dana and Chris, uh, little Chris and Hannah Mae. Um, she also had a very good relationship with Chelsea, who was the mother of Brentley. Um, we talked about how her last call was to her sister Miranda earlier that night, and she was there when Frankie took the last picture he ever would take of his two sons laying next to each other. She was all of 20 years old as well at the very beginning of her life, and especially her life as a mother. Um, her crime, you heard testimony, that her crime was solely being there, nothing else. If she had not been there, she would still be alive today. Okay, um, Chris Sr., there's a lot to say about him. Obviously, he was a hard worker. He got up every morning and went and worked at Big Bear Lake all day, building stuff, um, bulldozing stuff. Um, he was obviously a family man, provided for his family, provided for his son Frankie and Hannah Hazel and Ruger, provided for his former wife Dana and his children Hannah Mae and little Chris, so that they, um, especially Hannah Mae, could have uh, a home with extra space that was clean and orderly, um, all in anticipation of the custody battle um, that was ensuing. He threw, you heard about his 4th of July fireworks. Um, obviously, he grew marijuana. That's not in dispute in this case. And noteworthy as well, that's also not why he was killed. That has nothing to do with this case. Um, it, as I noted in the beginning, it caused some distraction for the investigation initially because of you know trying to see if there was any ties um, with the marijuana. Um, but the reason that he was killed is because he was the patriarch of this family, and they knew that he would, again, figure out who did it and potentially seek vengeance, but also Keep in mind that he was a he was one of the original targets, right? Angela suggested that they snitch on him and get him locked up because that would be taking off the head of the snake, and then uh, uh, Hannah Mae would not have the support that she needed to withstand a custody battle. Um, obviously, that um, idea got voted down, but again, that's why he was targeted um, for these murders. Gary is the only one that had any drugs in his system. Um, we know that he abused cocaine sometimes. Um, we know that he was from Kentucky, and he would come and stay with his cousin, Chris, and when he was with his cousin, Chris, he would go and also work at Big Bear Lake. Um, he was described as goofy, and the defendant himself told you that he went and hunted with him down in Kentucky. Um, again, his crime was simply being there. He had nothing to do with any of the um, suspicions that Angela was developing in her mind um, or that the Wagners thought were occurring. Kenneth was a hardworking man, a very generous man. You heard that he would get up at 4.30 in the morning and drive over to his brother Chris's house where he would shower and then drive up to Columbus, Ohio and work every day, a full, a full day. Would come home and usually get dinner at Giovanni's and then go back to his home. You heard from his daughter, Kendra, and his son, Luke. And Kendra told you that she had talked to him earlier that day and they both told you that he was very present in their lives and very supportive of them, um, provided for them. 
and in pursuing their careers, um, schooling for both of them. You also heard from Donald Stone. I think that was a very long time ago, but it, I think his testimony was a little hard to forget. He talked about how generous Kenneth was and that he would give him family and non-family alike anything they needed um, anytime they had need. Again, we know why he was killed, and the defendant also to told you that um, he was a very strong guy. Um, the defendant said he considers his own self very stout, but that Kenneth was much stronger than he was. And they knew, again, the closeness uh, that he had to his brother, Chris, and that he would figure out what happened. And therefore, um, that is why they decided that he also had to be killed. Dana was a very loving mother and grandmother. You heard that she was going to watch Brentley the following day because Chelsea had called up Frankie at the last minute and asked if he, if she, if he could watch Brentley so that Chelsea could uh, do his, her work shift because um, the daycare had um, an illness there. Um, you also heard from Angela's own mouth uh, how close Dana was to her grandchildren, how she was constantly doing things for her grandchildren, taking them shopping or having little cookouts at her house. She was a caretaker. She worked long, hard hours at the nursing home. Um, they had not fully moved in, but you could tell that she kept an orderly home and that family and faith were very important to her. You hear on one of uh, Jake's recordings where she's telling Sophia to take Daddy and show him throughout the new house that they had just moved into. Um, obviously trying to raise her children as well as she could. We know that little Chris was grounded at the time um, and from his car. So, um, and having just turned 16, I suspect that was a, a severe, as severe as punishment as you could dream of. Um, again, she was not suspected of doing anything wrong to Sophia at all. She was just there. Now, I would suggest that based on Jake's testimony, they waited until she got there, right? Um, because they drove by initially and she wasn't there. And so they didn't return until she was there. I have no idea if that was so that she didn't come home mid um, homicide or again whether they um, had made the decision that she also was going to die. Hannah Mae had just turned 19 years old. You know that she had just given birth to Kylie who was five days old at the time that she was killed. You know that she's the mother of little Sophia who was two and a half at the time. And she had just turned 19. She was working um, she was going to school to become a nurse. She had gotten her GED. Um, she had become involved with Corey Holdren. You heard also his rather emotional testimony about how committed they were to each other, how touched he was by the fact that she sat with him and helped him beat his addiction while he was going through withdrawals, and how much that meant to him because his perception was nobody had ever done anything like that for him before, and he felt that that was a great um, act of love and sacrifice. He had met with Charlie Gilly, who was the actual father of Kylie. Um, you heard that uh, Hannah found out she was pregnant with Charlie's baby right when she and Corey had just started dating. Um, so he, Corey met with Charlie and, and said, is it okay if I raise your daughter? And Charlie was <coughs> okay with that. Charlie's also young, also um, was not prepared for um, parenting. So you heard from Corey that he named Kylie and that he was there at the hospital when she was born and cut her umbilical cord. Um, and clearly he's touched um, by the relationship that he had with Hannah Mae. We know that Hannah was a loving and proud mother of Sophia. We have text messages from her where she's describing her as her whole world um, and obviously refusing to sign any paperwork that the Wagners were putting before her because of her fear that they were trying to do to her what they did to Tabitha, and she was never going to permit that to happen. She also was not 
as easily manipulated as Tabitha was. Tabitha came from a very broken home and didn't have the support system that Hannah May did. And so that turns out to be her crime and why she needed to die. They not, did not think that she had done anything wrong to Sophia, but they felt that when she was with her, um, that Hannah was bringing her up against um, people that she shouldn't. And again, um, the reality of those fears um, is, is questioned, but that was their perception. So that is why she died that night, is because she refused to be manipulated by the Wagners because she refused to sign the paperwork giving custody to them. And finally, little Chris, all of 16 years old, um, just had his driver's, got his driver's license, was very happy and proud of that. Um, nobody had anything bad to say about him other than he was the annoying little brother that had to tag along with Hannah Mae whenever Hannah Mae went to see um, Jake when they first started dating. And that, again, was uh, because Chris and Dana didn't want Hannah Mae to be alone with Jake when she would be up there with them. His crime, again, you heard from Angela <coughs> say that uh, she thought that, that Sophia was red, she thought that she had an odor, and she noticed her touching herself, um, and she asked her, why do, you, why do you do that? Asked a two-year-old, why do you do that? And she said, Chris does it for bubblegum. That's, that's what Angela says the response was. And from that, Angela extrapolates, obviously, this heightened fear um, that the Wagners um, have obsessed about. But she extrapolates that maybe little Chris is doing something to Sophia. And so that, that is the evidence that was used to make the decision to kill him in his sleep. So how do we get to this point where decisions like that are being made? And how do we know that the defendant, George Wagner IV, is involved? Well, again, at the beginning of this case, before you heard any evidence about the homicides, I tried to convey to you as best I could, talking to you about the women in the Wagner's lives. And you must have been wondering then, and maybe still a little bit now, what that has to do with the murders in this case, right? It was almost, I'm gonna say soap opera-ish, but it's like, what does the fact that George used to date Tabitha and Jake was with this girl named Bethann and, and all that stuff have to do with it? Well, again, I hope that now you have a better feel for why that matters um, and why that is important. These issues with the women and children in their lives should never have led to such a drastic result, but it did. And again, I think you got a glimpse when both Jake and Angela testified, somewhat more, I think, with Angela, but how their minds worked um, when dealt, dealing with the women who gave them children, um, and especially when they lost control of those women. Could, could I see counsel up here just a moment? I'm sorry to interrupt you.
We'll start with Tabitha. You heard from Tabitha, but you also heard from other people who had information about the relationship that she had with George and the interplay with the remaining of the family. George started the relationship with Tabitha when she was very young, around 10 or 11. Um, we know that she came from a somewhat broken home, that she was uh, traumatized as a child, um, and that nobody held anybody accountable for that. Um, and again, this becomes a theme in the women who find themselves ensnared in the Wagner's lives. You'll recall that Angela encouraged um, Tabitha to go lay down with George again when, they were, when she was 10 or 11 because he was upset and needed consoling because of something a grandparent had said to him. So again, this is just kind of the start of that whole process where the relationship is a family affair. Um, we know after they were married, Tabitha talked about Angela basically tucking George in at night, rubbing his back, how she would have conversations with, with her um, about the type of sex they should or should not be having. Um, we know that they accused Tabitha of being abusive, not sexually, um, but abusive, um, and capable or at risk of being sexually abusive just from the mere fact that she herself was abused. Um, they accused her of stealing from them, they accused her of poisoning them with food. Again, these are all recurring themes that we see over and over with each of the women who stayed with the Wagners. We know she was not allowed to have contact with her family. Um, obviously her uh, offender, that makes perfect sense, but the remainder of her family, um, it does not. Um, we know especially once they learned that she had been unfaithful, that was a transgression that she committed. She was unfaithful after she and George were married. Um, but you heard that they took her phone from her and factory reset it and Angela kept the phone. Again, this family involvement in all of that process. We know that she had not seen her mother for over a year. We also know that on the night that she literally fled for her life, that George hit her, and Angela threw a two by four at her. Angela told you that herself. And she told Tabitha that she was going to get her gun. Again, this was a family affair. When Tabitha makes it outside, she said that she bit um, George because his arm was up and blocking her. Um, once she gets outside, she hides under a truck. And she says they're out there with flashlights looking for her. And we heard that um, from Angela that Jake and Angela went up to the neighbor's house in Hannah's car to see if maybe she had wandered over there um, seeking safety or trying to make a phone call. Um, when they couldn't find her, they came back and Jake and George got into a truck and went to try to find her. And they did find her pedaling on a bicycle, flat tires, trying to make it to the gas station so that she could call her mother. Um, and we know this happened not just through Tabitha's testimony to you and not just through the parts of it that Jake and Angela corroborate, but also Hannah May herself corroborated this. And how do we know that? We know that because she called Chelsea Robinson. Remember Chelsea's testimony? that um, she got this terrifying call from Hannah Mae um, saying that um, she didn't have much time to talk, that they had taken her phone and she was using one of their phones. And she said they told her that they would cut off her legs if she tried to leave. That's what Hannah said to Chelsea while this was happening. She said they had chased Tabitha out of the house, that Tabby got out and Angela got a gun and took off after her, and that Angela and Jake and George were looking for her. She told Chelsea not to call her back because they told her not to reach out to anyone. Of course, Chelsea was very terrified about all this, asked her if she was okay, and uh, Hannah asked her not to tell anybody. And you remember from Chelsea's testimony that she said she did ultimately tell Chris Sr. 
about what was going on and how that upset Hannah Mae because Hannah Mae was still with um, Jake and stayed with him for a few months after this um, and how that um, came between them. At some point, I expect, and I think we, we kind of heard this from the questioning, um, the concept that, well, they didn't kill Tabitha, right? They went about getting custody the right way. They went to the courts. But again, let's review that. First of all, um, Hannah also, you will see, um, in her communications with Tabitha, she talked about that night, and she said she didn't know what would happen if they had managed to get her back into the house. Um, so that was Hannah's concerns, is that something bad was going to happen if they had gotten Tabitha back into the house. Instead, she fled, but what did they do then? They go to the gas station, and they called the police. George called the police um, at the behest of Jake and Angela because the concern was that Tabitha would report George hitting her, Angela threatening to get a gun, them chasing her, um, et cetera. And that would not bode well for custody. So instead, they beat her to the punch, more or less, even though she herself did not call the police. She merely called her mother to come and get her um, for help. But again, they had no problem falsifying a police report to say that she was the aggressor there's four of them, one of her, um, and so she ends up with a disorderly conduct charge that is amongst your exhibits that apparently she showed up and paid some bond forfeiture for um, subsequent to that. But again, this was what gives them leverage in the almighty custody battle, right? And when does that custody battle happen? Within two weeks, there is a typed up, prepared separation or disillusion uh, where she's given away her son completely. Now, does she think she's given away her son completely? They would like you to think so. But how do we know that's not true? Well, we know it's not true because if you look at the language of the agreement, it says that visitation will be reasonable and it will be agreed to by the parties. Silly her thought that that meant they would discuss it and they would reach a mutual agreement. She had no idea that within a few months, that was uh, not going to be the case. She, she did not want bovine at that time because she was living with her former perpetrator at that time, her stepfather and her mother. Um, but she wanted to be able to get him more once she got on her feet and got a job. And how do we know that's true? Well, because in your evidence, um, in your, your evidence that you will have back in the jury room, you will see letters, and we talked about this. I had Tabitha read these letters to you. You will see letters from Tabitha to George in March of 2015. Within two months of going to court and signing that uh, disillusion, um, she is telling him that she has seen an attorney and you heard her say that she consulted with an attorney and he said that she should try to work it out you know, without going through the courts and then the expense of the courts um, if she could. And so she sent him not one letter but two letters, one uh, by certified mail and one by direct mail. And we know he got them because they're still in his belongings when we go up to <coughs> state 41. So clearly she did not intend to permanently give up her son in that situation or else two months later she wouldn't be knocking at his door and you'll see that she also left him a note saying that she was was going to start exercising visitation every wednesday and he wasn't there i'll be back next wednesday i'd like to drop off an easter basket etc so again um you know the fact that they take advantage of her she's unrepresented she's young um, and she believes them when they said that this was just a temporary um, ordeal. You also know that um, until they are arrested in 2018, they are still working as a family. And again, I think that's the important 
part of this, right? It's not just George doing this. It's Jake and Angela going to the neighbors. It's Jake and George going to the gas station. It's Jake and Angela suggesting to George they call the police. But then George calls the police. Then there's you know this insistence that it be supervised visitations. Until they get arrested in 2018, they are still working as a family, all to make sure that Tabitha never gets any unsupervised visits with Bullvine. And frankly, hardly any supervised visits, as it were. You heard her talk about it. You saw the messages from um, between Hannah Mae and Tabitha where she's talking about how every time she wants to see him, he's, quote, got to work. And you know, Hannah's suggesting, well, Angela's there. Surely she could supervise. Or all, you just can tell that he, he is not um, accommodating to her. They move to Alaska um, so that he's, her child is definitely away from her. And when they get back, you heard talk about this. This is on the T3, the, the wire uh, recordings, where they're talking about how they have to stay low until June 7th of 2018 so that George can claim abandonment. How about you know that Tabitha wants to see her child. How about you just let her see her child instead of trying to put this uh, wench between she and her son, which you can't really make this, the child feel good either, right? Um, and we know that Jake was having Hannah get information on Tabitha. So again, this whole family um, effort. We know that initially George was monitoring Tabitha's Facebook. Um, he wants you to believe that that was after they split up, she gave him her, his, her password, even though she told you she's never given her password. And that doesn't even make sense. Why after you leave would you, uh, that night that you flee for your life and you never ever go back, why would you then uh, hand out a password? Regardless, you heard from both Jake and Angela that first George was monitoring the Facebook and then Jake and Angela also would participate, mainly Angela, but that as she was getting information, she was sharing it with all of them, with Jake and um, with George. We also know that there were screenshots of all these things. First, when we're, we're at State Route 41, we have paper print-offs of lots of pages, Facebook pages, um, of Tabitha and her mother, Tess and her sister. Then when we get the laptop from Montana, we see thousands of screenshots, again, from that. So this was a thing that was ongoing daily. And again, it makes no sense. Um, you know, George wants you to believe that, uh, oh, I just monitored it for a little while, and then I told my mom, stop doing that. Really? Because She's monitoring to make sure that Tabitha's not going to wage a custody battle to see if she's talking about hiring an attorney or whatever, and also trying to get dirt on her to use if there is a custody battle. So again, we'll talk about that a little bit later when we're talking about the reasonableness of what uh, certain witnesses say versus um, the defendant. But just ask yourself, what, which is more reasonable in that case? Do you believe that he was just monitoring for her faithfulness, or do you believe that uh, Jake and Angela and George were monitoring the Facebook all to combat any potential custody battles? Angela also freely admitted to you that, and, and quite honestly, um, Tabitha didn't know. When she testified for you, she thought, she had a hunch that Angela was the one, or George or Jake, you know, had called the State Highway Patrol on her because she got stopped on her way back to her home after visiting with Bullvine at their house. And she just found it ironic that some, you know, state trooper would just pull her over randomly and say that they got an anonymous call that she had drugs in her car. Again, um, the, that's for custody battle purposes, right? So again, another false report through law enforcement in order to thwart any custody attempts. Now, Angela denies doing anything to the infant child of Tabitha. Um, 
maybe it was somebody else in the house. I don't know. But again, it seems ironic that after she visits there, then her child um, becomes very ill and has substance in her um, body. At that time, she was still monitoring Tabitha's account. And there was conversations that Tabitha was having saying that just because she was not faithful, she was told by her attorney is not a reason to uh, show that she's unfit, that there has to be something more. And so this became something more, right? The state highway patrol um, and potentially, you know, her own child. Again, if they are willing to kill eight people, then I don't think it's that far-fetched. Hannah Mae, um, very similar start in that she was young, not 10 or 11, but closer to 13 when she first started dating Jake, who was four and a half years her senior, so he was almost 18 at the time they started dating. Um, I did find it interesting that everybody seems to remember that story of how they met um, the, at the fairgrounds and she had a pet rabbit and um, they all remembered that, Jake, Angela, and George. Um, Hannah was a bit different, of course, than, than Tabitha and we talked about that, about how she had a better support system. Uh, she was less malleable, she had her own transportation. Um, eventually, and so um, she was different in that regard, but the Wagners did still try to dominate her time, and you will see that in the conversations between Jake and Hannah, and that was this 83 pages, I think, some of those are cover sheets, but it had the various conversations between them and how he wanted her to always come to his place, he would never come to her place, just that sort of thing, and she's talking about how his, her family doesn't see Sophia nearly as much as Jake's family does, etc. So again, you see that, and you see that in her conversation with Tabitha, again, about the control that the Wagners exert over you. Ultimately, um, Jake chokes Hannah, and she calls her father to come pick her up, which he does and that ends their relationship. Um, I would point out again that I find it interesting that George said on his, during his testimony <coughs> that he wasn't home when this happened. He didn't know why it happened. He had no idea because he's trying to convince us, of course, that he was oblivious to any problems between Jake and Hannah, right? And why is that important? Because the problems between Jake and Hannah are why they killed Hannah and her whole family. So he's trying to act like this is just that one drama that he did not know about. However, I probably don't have my glasses, but I'll try my best. Um, Hannah says to Tabby in May of 2015, yeah, when Jake choked me, George brought up the fact that I got raped and nothing was done about it. But I never told anyone because the person who done it to me told me he would go away for a long time. If I could change time, I would, but now everybody knows it happened. So again, this family affair, right? Jake is choking Hannah and George is there talking about the fact that Hannah was raped and nobody did anything about it, which again, as we know, is a big red flag for the Wagners. If you were molested and you didn't do anything about it, then you are a danger to Sophia and Bullvine. And that's just the way they think. After that, you start seeing the journal entries by um, Angela, various things, the time when George and Jake went and picked up Sophia to get her medicine because she was had a bellyache, um, you know, just documenting all those things. Um, you see that uh, 
Jake tries to get Hannah to sign his 50-50 papers, but Hannah won't sign anything. Um, and not only does she say to Tabitha's mother that she won't sign papers ever, um, she says that to Jake too, to the point that the attorney tells him that he does not stand a chance of getting full custody of his daughter in Ohio because they were never married and Hannah's not an unfit mother. Um, so armed with that, um, and again, due to the monitoring of Facebook that they were doing as a family of Tabitha and Tess, her mother, um, that's when they see the message from Hannah Mae when she says, I won't sign papers ever, it won't happen. They'll have to kill me first. Angela and Jake both say that this message was shared um, and talked about amongst the three of them. And then that's when the plotting begins. We know that in January, that was December of 2015, we know that in January of 2016, they had made the decision that they were going to kill them. And you start seeing the purchases corresponding to that timeline um, where they're starting to buy items to uh, build silencers and such. We also know that Jake had Samantha Staley spying on Hannah because she lived close to Corey Holdren and so he was having her and you saw those text messages and you heard from Samantha and that she stopped doing it when um, Angela called. Um, again, this family affair. Beth Ann then, last but not least, um, in many ways she was the linchpin in this case because when we were starting to listen to them in 2018 after they had come back to Ohio and Beth Ann was with them, we heard conversations, especially immediately before we had started any of our, renewed our investigative work, such that they would be a little more careful about what they were saying and doing. Um, and we simply knew then that our theory of the case was correct, right? Again, it's hard to imagine that eight people would lose their lives over such a flimsy motive, but it's true. Right? You heard from the people who made the decision and what and how they made the decision. Um, right away, we hear George and Angela being very upset with Jake because Jake had the audacity to tell Sophia that she could call Beth Ann mom because, after all, she was her stepmother. And um, Jake had apparently explained to uh, Sophia that Angela was actually her grandmother and not her mother, which was terrible as far as George and Angela were concerned because Bullvine was thoroughly convinced that Angela was his mother. And now, according to George, he was going to have to tell him, tell Bullvine, the quote, cold, hard truth. And you heard those um, recordings, and I would certainly invite you to listen to them again, um, but where he is, uh, you know, extremely upset with Jake. And again, just parroting exactly the same things that Angela says to Jake. Again, then George tries to convince us on the stand that, well, no, Bullvine knew that Tabitha was his mom. Well, then what was the big deal? What, what truth did he have to explain to him if that, in fact, was the truth? Um, and quite honestly, it would have been nice and polite of them to let them know that Angela was not his mother and that Tabitha actually was his mother. Um, and that's where we drop back into their lives. Um, then we also hear conversations between George and Angela talking about Beth Ann and all of the um, conspiracy theories that they had um, as to her. And then we hear again, conversations between Jake and George, where, and this is in the truck when they're driving together, and George is just going off. And in fact, um, States Exhibit 23, I don't have XX, EE. 
I'll give you the number later. Um, but it is call number 502, and this was the lengthier call, but it is the call where George is absolutely losing his mind with Jake and telling him that Beth Ann has to get out of the house, that he does not trust her, that he does not feel um, safe having Bullvine in the same house as her, that he does not feel that Sophia is safe, that Jake is falling down on the job, um, he's not putting Sophia first, he's not making her a priority. Goodness sakes, you know, when, when he gets home from a week of driving, Beth Ann knocks Sophia over just to get to him before Sophia does. Um, and tells him that she's leaving the door unlocked, or not leaving the door unlocked, rather. The door's locked, and allegedly Beth Ann is getting up in the middle of the night and unlocking the front door just to put them all at risk. Um, and he's worried that she's going to kidnap the kids and take them to a cult in Texas, um, that she's going to molest them. She says that, or he says that um, they can move out, but if they move out, they have to leave Sophia with George and Angela because Jake is not going to protect Sophia. George will. And I think this is an extremely telling conversation. Again, this was one of those early ones. Um, and he's, you know, speaking freely, if you will. And it demonstrates everything that if only we had recordings back in 2016 when they were leading up to commit these offenses. Because I would strongly invite you to listen to that recording again and ask yourselves if that is the voice or the demeanor or the attitude or the approach of somebody who would ever sit one out, who would ever not be involved if Angela was saying the same things then about Hannah and little Chris and Frankie and all the other people that were in the, in the mix then whenever Sophia went to the rodents. If Angela was saying the same things then, you know that George was hearing it and parroting it back and feeling just as strongly. You heard Angela talk about how she had a conversation with just Jake and George in the kitchen, which is where I think everything in their family happens, and asked them if they were sure about what they were doing, meaning the homicides. And she said, None of them wanted to do it. They were all, quote, reluctant. But they knew they had no other choice. They had to do this to protect Sophia. So listen to this phone call, or conversation, rather, between Jake and George. Because it embodies exactly that. George is not going to let anything happen to Sophia to the point that he's going to keep Sophia from Jake himself. Because Jake's not protecting from big, bad, you met her, Beth Ann, Elizabeth Armour, at the time was going by Beth. So, again, complete flimsy allegations in regards to Beth Ann, right? Similar flimsy allegations in regards to the rodents, but they whip themselves into a frenzy. And if anything, you can tell in this phone call or conversation that it's, it's George and Angela that are leading the charge. It's not Jake and Angela. It is George and Angela. And Jake tries to convince them that he's lost his mind, that George and Angela are paranoid and that they're, they're going on, on a bunch of what ifs and what nots, I think is what he called it, and just keep spinning themselves into a tizzy, which is exactly what was happening. But it was happening with both Angela and George. And again, like I said, if you listen to that, um, I think it captures the essence. Then what do we know about what they do with her? Well, they accuse her of being sexually abusive, right? although Sophia recanted and said that she just said it to, because she doesn't like her or something, or uh, Jake, uh, you know, never 
believed it. Jake never believed it. Of course, George and Angela did. Um, they accused her of stealing money. Um, you'll see in, uh, I guess the YY exhibit, uh, Angela is keeping a journal and she talks about this poisoning. Uh, again, food type poisoning. Um, so accuser being abusive, accuser of stealing, accuser of food poisoning, um, not allowed to have contact with her family. Sound familiar? Uh, not allowed to tell them where she lives. Again, reminiscent of Tabitha, where they created the fake Facebook, which you will have in your um, exhibits as well. And you'll see on the fake Facebook, it says, you know, coming back from Michigan, working at the Holiday Inn or whatever. That's not exactly it, because it might have been a Super 8 motel. But just spinning this completely fake uh, information so that anybody that was looking for her would be kind of thrown off the track. Same thing with Beth Ann. She was not allowed to tell her family where she lived. We know that uh, Jake and Angela confronted her again in the kitchen. And during that confrontation, uh, Jake was giving her the benefit of the doubt or saying that he didn't know if she did it or not, but that if he ever found out that she had done it, <coughs> you remember this, the Lucille bat from Walking Dead, he's talked very vividly about making a Lucille bat, stringing her up in the barn and beating her to death with the bat and then burning the barn down to the ground um, so her family would never find her. You know that she called, well, used to be her friend uh, that she had lived with in Alaska, who was former law enforcement. Um, and uh, he talked to Jake and then got her back on the phone and said, oh, he didn't mean it, um, you know, minimized it, right? But at that moment, she knew that she needed to get out of there. She knew because she told you the things they were accusing her of, they had said Tabitha did. And she knew what they thought about Tabitha. So she knew she needed to get, well, the getting was good, right? And she talked to you about how basically it was this dance where George was pressuring and Angela was pressuring Jake to get Beth out. And Jake was slowly caving to that idea. And simultaneously, Beth Ann's trying to convince them to come up with this plan where Oh, I sh you know, maybe you can tell them I'm, I'm a risk because of BCI, so I'll go to college, whatever. They're both trying to get out. And she does ultimately get out. Before she gets out, though, she writes in her journal. And again, that journal that, by the way, George texts to Angela. So again, the idea that he ever is not in the middle of the fray is preposterous. This is going on, the journal is found, um, George has it on his phone, he texts it to Angela, and in that is an incredibly, again, astute observations by Beth Ann. She was a very quick study in less than three months of living with them. She had reached, you know, had all the information she needed and, and made her exit. But she talks about the controlling nature um, of Angela and this family. So I would invite you also um, to look at that. One of the things, and again, this is, um, you know, the idea that uh, George wants to distance himself from this family. Oh, we didn't have family meetings. Well, they, you might call it a family meeting, but we'll I don't call it a family meeting. Well, ironically, they do. Uh, Angela does. Angela says, when you get home, we have to have a family meeting. That's what they're called. Um, and in this same call, George says to Jake, the family has spoken. The family has spoken, Jake. Not me, I'm telling you. Not Ian, my mom. The family has spoken. Mom doesn't want her on the complex. 
So again, George is very much in this, very much dictating, very much making determinations um, with the life of his brother and his brother's wife. He was married. That didn't matter. We're getting rid of her. So again, just kind of to kind of capsulate, basically, you know, why we, I find myself talking to you about the women in the Wagner's lives and the children and all the back and forth battles and crazy suspicions that they had and what they did when they were faced with those suspicions. You know, each one of these women, Tabitha, Hannah and Beth Ann had been abused as children and nothing had been done about it, which again is a big red flag for the Wagners. Um, they tried to control them as much as they could. Um, you know for uh, Beth Ann, the very first night of their honeymoon, on their honeymoon, they consummate the marriage and then it's give me your password, give me your social security, give me your bank account, give me everything. Give me all the keys to your life synced the phone with them, was GPS tracking her, um, all those things. Um, at some point, uh, called a private investigator to potentially spy on her or get, get information on her. Um, Angela talking about sex with them. Um, why is that important? That's important, at least <coughs> in our minds, because there is nothing that happens in that household that is not a group decision, right? That at least Angela is not involved in, okay? So Beth Ann talks about it in her journal that the most private of affairs she is involved in. She, they are always accused of being abusive or at least likely to become abusive or permit abuse, accuses them of stealing, accuses them of poisoning, demands that they relinquish all control of their children. Um, even with Beth Ann, she had to sign the prenuptial that she wouldn't you know, try to get custody um, or anything um, if there was a divorce. Um, and they're willing to resort to crimes if the women don't cooperate, right? So we know with Tabitha, they, I mean, assaults aside, right? I mean, keep in mind the vividness of Tabitha's testimony to you was when he hit her, she said, you just signed your divorce papers. Good for her. I mean, good for her with her upbringing that she was able to recognize that as wrong and, and had the strength to, to leave at that time. Um, the violence aside, you know, Jake choking Hannah, I know he describes it as holding her with his arm here on her collarbone. Um, she certainly perceived it as choking, and we know that because it's all over her um, conversations that you'll have. Um, that aside, you know, the falsifications, uh, the Facebook hacking, you know, stalking them, and not just Tabitha, right? Uh, certainly Tabitha's mom didn't give any passwords away. We never heard anything about that, but Tabitha was very clear that she never gave George or anybody else in that family her password, and they did not have permission to be in her Facebook. That's a crime. You'll see it in your indictment. So, you know, calling the state highway patrol on a false, I mean, wasting resources. Um, again, they are not afraid to resort to crimes, and of course, ultimately, the crimes that they committed in this case. Um, spying on them electronically and or in person, violence or threats of violence to get compliance or control. Again, um, one of the conversations between Jake and Hannah is a girl emoji with four, ironically, four guns pointed at her head. And she says, this is what you want. Um, so again, very strong awareness um, by the girls that um, that they won't stop at anything when it comes to the children. Um, with Tabitha, obviously Angela threatened to get her gun. George assaulted her. They chase her. She hides. Um, they call the police on her. 
Um, they tell Hannah Mae that they'll cut her legs off uh, if she tries to leave that night. And they tell Beth Ann that they will beat her to death if they ever find out that she actually did the sex abuse. That well, ladies and gentlemen, this is argument, so I'm going to hold you objection. They tell her that um, they will beat her to death. And, you know, she, she denies, of course, ever sexually abusing anybody, um, in particular uh, Sophia. And she talked about how hard that was because how could she disprove that? Um, and again, the whole family affair, the fact that they are all involved in each other's business, that this very much is a Jake, George, and Angela at 260 Peterson Road. You know that Billy was off living at the Flying W. We know from the tower dump that um, Ms. Forney gave us that on the night of the homicides was the first night that Billy ever spent the night there. So it is, by and large, Jake, George, and Angela at 260 Peterson working together and making these decisions. Um, you know, using different addresses. They had Beth Ann use a different address so that Tabitha would find out where they lived. They each used the Oak Hill address of Rita. That would be the farm that Rita had to sell to pay for her attorney fees in this case. And so they used that even though they never stepped foot in there, they never lived there for one day or one hour. They knew they were going to 52 Havner Lane because that was Angela's now deceased father's home that she was inheriting. And they purposely did it to hide their whereabouts from top until June 7th. You've got that on one of your recordings where they're talking about, oh boy, Angela's upset because Beth Ann is going into town. She's gonna work at some place. Um, can't remember now the location, but some of Tabitha's family apparently works in that same general area, and the fear is that they'll find out. Um, and it's talked about there, the June 7th date. So um, that is a recording available for you as well. We know that Jake was making recordings of his interactions with Hannah, and we know that George is there on two of those occasions. And one of those occasions, again, he says that he doesn't, he didn't know that Jake was making a recording, but you can listen to it and, and make that determination for yourself because it sounds an awful lot like he's making that comment so that it's captured on the recording because when Sophia gets into the car, he confronts his little niece and says, uh, why are you so filthy? Don't they know how to give you a bath? Again why on earth you would say that to uh, a two and a half year old child um, unless you were doing what the, these recordings were meant to capture, um, which is negative. Reviews regarding Hannah and her parenting. Um, he also is in the background on one of those and you can hear him saying, hurry up, get out of here before Chris and them come up here and then very urgently trying to get him, uh, Jake, to not drive past Chris's house. George couldn't explain that to you. I can't explain it either. But again, very much involved, very present, very much aware of what's going on between Hannah and Jake. Because he's with him all the time. He works with him all the time. Again, he wants to put that distance between them. But that distance does not exist. They live together. At the border, he says he and his brother run the house at Peterson Road, that they take turns making decisions. Well, it is when I ask him about it on the stand and he confirms it. Well, council approaches. <laughs>
overruled the objection. The, the, as I indicated before, the arguments of each attorney are not evidence. You must rely on your collective memories to what the evidence is. So I'm going to permit each attorney to argue what they feel, uh, with, you know, within bounds of reasonableness, what they feel that you should find that the evidence is. But you'll have to rely on your collective memories to, uh, as to what the evidence is. That, let me also say that the, the, the order of which we do things is, is a matter of long standing. The prosecutor goes first in these arguments. The defense counsel will have an equal opportunity to present argument after the state, and then the state has an opportunity to present rebuttal uh, argument. So you may proceed with your argument. Thank you, Your Honor. You may recall that when the defendant was on the stand, I asked him about that because he was saying how controlling his mother was. And I confronted him with the fact that that's not what he said at the border. That at the border, he rebuked that idea that his mother was controlling in response to the agent saying, oh, your mother is so controlling, she probably masterminded this whole homicide, etc." To which he very quickly came to her defense and said she wasn't controlling, that he and his brother owned that home. She lived with them because she had medical conditions and babysits for the kids, and that he and his brother, Jake, were in the house. This is what he said at the border, okay? That was before he came to you and sat here and needed to say something different because he no longer wants to be in cahoots with his brother, right? He no longer wants that relationship with his brother because if he has that relationship, he knows that you'll know that they were all involved in this together. Okay. Um, you know, again, asking other people to um, spy on them. So again, why do we go over this? Basically because it gives us a bird's eye into the dynamics of the home. And like I said, Beth Ann was really the linchpin in that we were hearing conversations and then her journal just kind of said what we thought all along, right? Um, they're all together when it comes to the safety and welfare of Sophia and Bullvine, and they will do anything to protect. Okay, so the second part of that question was how do we know the defendant was involved? Well, I've already kind of touched on some of the things that um, I think are indicative um, just from a common sense. The judge is gonna tell you that you should use your reason and common sense. We don't leave that at the door. There's no magical, mystical standard we use here when deciding this case. It's tests that you use in your own lives every day in deciding whether or not something adds up or makes sense, um, is believable. You're also gonna be instructed about direct and circumstantial evidence. Now, you'll recall, we've talked about this in Boisdier, if you can remember back that long ago. Um, the circumstantial evidence. The court is gonna instruct you that you can consider circumstantial evidence to have the same weight as direct evidence. Again, based on the quality of that evidence, based on whether or not you believe it, um, but, for instance, circumstantial evidence of wake, you know, going to bed at night and there's no snow on the ground, you wake up in the morning and there's snow on the ground, you can assume, you can make an inference, that's circumstantial evidence that it snowed overnight, right? Um, very strong evidence, almost as strong as if you saw it with your own two eyes when it was actually snowing. Uh, unfortunately, you might see some of that <laughs> in the near future. So. Um, we'll talk about the circumstantial evidence in this case, because there's a lot of it. The ballistic evidence, the shoe evidence, the silencer, the purchases they were making, um, the custody documents that they forged. There is a lot of circumstantial evidence that is almost as good as us actually being there and seeing them commit these crimes. We also have direct evidence uh, that we did not have when we first uh, arrested them in this case. And the direct evidence is testimony of witnesses 
who were actually there. And this brings us back to, um, you'll also remember in voir dire, we had some lengthy discussion about being the captain of the high sea and being responsible for the law enforcement on the um, waters where there's pirates who are um, taking in uh, perfectly innocent civilians and having them walk the plank and plunge to their death. And the only people that we have uh, to find out what actually happened on that pirate ship are other pirates, right? So we'll talk about that and we'll talk to you about the instruction that you're gonna receive on how to weigh this evidence of Jake and Angela. But you will also be getting an instruction on how to weigh the testimony of any witness, right? You know, things like the opportunity they had to see um, what they're talking about, the reasonableness of their testimony, uh, their demeanor, their frankness, or their lack of frankness, their accuracy of their memory. Again, these are, it's great that they're written down <laughs> and we fall back on that, but these are things you guys read in your everyday life, right? Um, does it make sense what they're telling you? Um, you know, someone comes up to you and says, no, it didn't snow last night. Well, I can see it did, right? You know, so, I mean, the believability of it certainly um, comes into play there. We also have what the court will refer to as other acts evidence, and other acts evidence can be tricky um, in that you're, you will be instructed that you cannot use it, they would say, for propensity, okay? So basically, so I committed a bunch of thefts. <laughs> um, just because I committed a bunch of thefts doesn't make me a murderer, right? nor does it even mean that I've committed another theft, a subsequent theft, right? So you can't say, oh, well, just because you are a bad guy or you, you've committed crimes means you're, you're likely to have done this too, right? But you can use other acts evidence, so the information about all of the crimes that they did commit together as a family, right? We, we heard about that. Um, pretty awful, right? Pretty awful way to raise your children. Um, so that you're teaching them how to commit crimes. Making games of it, right, and punishing them, right? Giving them a dollar, I don't remember. I think the dollar was for the campus. Could be wrong about that. There was another game for spotting police. And if you didn't spot the police or the camera, because I don't remember which one it was, before your dad did, then you lost your four-wheeler. And the other game was you got a dollar every time you spotted either the officer or the camera, right? That was at a very young age that that started. And it progressed. And he taught them to pick locks. And he taught them to steal fuel and things they needed. And you heard Jake talk a lot about they would steal stuff that they needed on the farm to keep the farm going, right? Um, steal loads out of tractor trailers, right? There's discussion, diapers or boots? Which one are we gonna steal? Open it up, see what's in there. Is it worth the risk? Is it worth the... The, the effort to steal it. So, and the arsons, right? The arsons for insurance fraud purposes that they committed together. Um, again, just because they did that does not mean that they progressed to murder, right? Certainly not. But what it does show us is this behavioral fingerprint, and they'll talk about that, about how they function as a team. How they function in one of the charges, we. we as a criminal enterprise, right? They are out there. I mean, George talked about then after, you know, they would buy cars cheap. Prosecutor argued that the court, ladies and gentlemen, you, you have the evidence. You'll have to rely on the collective memories concerning the evidence. The court will instruct you as to the law 
but you must apply to, to the evidence as you find it. The argument of counsel for either side is not part of that evidence. The argument of either attorney is not. You may proceed with your argument. Thank you, Your Honor. George talked about getting cars that were up on blocks and getting them cheap, and then that person would report them stolen. And, you know, I didn't follow the scheme myself, but he was, you know, telling me that he was still out there engaging in those kinds of activities. He talked to you about the first time that he committed a crime like that without the help of his family. He was kind of proud of this moment, right? And this is when he told you that he and Chris Newcomb came up with the idea to wreck his truck because Chris needed money and he needed money, and they would wreck the truck and they'd both get money, and they were supposed to split the money in half. I think maybe that didn't happen. But he was all proud that this was the first time that he had committed a crime without the help of his family, never mind that Chris is his uncle and Jake is his brother, but he meant specifically George or Billy and Angela. So, again, the fact that they commit these crimes as a family and similar patterns, right? For the arsons, they know in advance they're going to do it. They come up with the idea, right? Then they prepare for it by moving the belongings out of the home so they don't get burned or crisp in the fire. And, you know, there was a tale from people about the, you know, one picture of Angela's that always survived every fire, you know. So planning and then committing the offense, again, together. Jake says that he and George were inside the house when the turkey went into the fire and set the fire. And Tabitha told you that was her belief as well. George obviously denies that and said that he was out working on his truck when that happened and that he was against it. But he knew it was going to happen, so he did participate in getting the stuff out of the house, his stuff and Tabitha's stuff out of the house. And then they covered up, right? They forged fake receipts to cover things up. So, again, that whole working as a unit. Angela talked about being a lookout, right, when he was stealing fuel the one time. And, you know, again, so they're taught to spot surveillance cameras. They're taught to spot law enforcement. Spot is taught to work as a team. So, again, those things you are allowed to consider just for his identity as a part of this criminal enterprise and a part of this conspiracy. And later we'll talk a little bit more about complicity as well. There's also, I talked about circumstantial evidence. Again, you'll get an instruction that you can consider that the same. So let's talk about the circumstantial evidence specifically that we have in this case that says that George Wagner participated in these crimes that are before you today. And, again, keep in mind, and I said I will talk to you about complicity probably towards the end when we're reviewing the actual charges with you. But he doesn't have to be the person that actually pulled the trigger, right? You heard that Jake Wagner pled to eight counts of aggravated murder because he pulled the trigger as to five, according to him, but he was complicit in the remaining three. You heard Angela Wagner say that she also was guilty of eight counts of aggravated murder because she was complicit in it, because she knew what they were going to do. She aided and abetted them. She purchased items for them to use during the offense. She helped them cover up the crimes afterwards, tried to help them cover up the crimes ahead of time by buying shoes that we would consider throwaway shoes that they would never normally wear and would not be tied back to them. So, again, she didn't even go up there. She didn't even go up there. And you will hear in the complicity instructions that you don't even have to be present in order to be complicit in a crime, right? So, and certainly, you know, she pled guilty to four counts of aggravated burglary, and that's what caused all that confusion 
um, when she wrote her letter to Frederica, basically saying, don't believe everything you see on TV. Like, I didn't go into the, those homes, and my plea makes it appear that I did. Um, likewise, I pled guilty to the gun specifications, even though I never had a gun on my person that night. But again, you were complicit because you knew what was gonna happen, you knew what they were gonna go do, um, and you aided and abetted them. The shoes certainly are a, a very strong piece of circumstantial <coughs> evidence. Keep in mind that from day, I won't say day one, but shortly thereafter, you heard the testimony from Suzanne Elliott, um, who works for BCI, about the initial findings at the crime scene, from the crime scene, right? That there were shoe prints left in blood that they knew had to belong to whoever committed these offenses, or at least one or two of the individuals that committed these offenses. <coughs> you heard that she figured out what shoes they were and that she ultimately figured out that we had two different sizes, a size 10 and a half and a size 11. And she would tell, she told you, make sure I get this right because these item numbers versus evidence numbers. So item 21, which is Twenty-three and forty-seven. You guys remember this? Um, those are the size elevens, and then twenty-four is the ten and a half. You have two of the size elevens in the crime scene in blood, and you heard from both Suzanne Elliott and Mr. Bozia, who reached the same conclusions across the board. Um, those were their findings as to scene one. And I think Ms. Elliott actually gave us more detail, um, mostly because I don't want to belabor anything for you guys. Um, but in that the blood pattern on the shoe was different too, right? So, you know, the size 10 and a half had a different pattern of blood on the bottom of the shoe, you know, where the blood stuck because they stepped, you know, different than the size 11. So that was often an additional way for them to tell that these were two different black shoes. Um, thank goodness they bought two different size shoes that day. Um, so we know we have a size 10 and a half and a size 11 inside that crime scene in blood. And then we go to <coughs> uh, State Route 41 and we find a receipt for those shoes. Um, and you heard testimony from Special Agent Jenkins. Uh, you heard from Ms. Eveslage. Um, maybe that was the third time you heard from her. Um, but she went back to the command post and looked up that date and time, and sure enough, pulls up uh, Angela Wagner buying those shoes. Um, we had collected the video ahead of time. We talk, told you about that um, because we knew for sure it was this shoe. So we had video footage of anybody <coughs> who had purchased those shoes in a 50 mile radius um, recently, right? Because one of the other things that they were able to tell about this shoe is that it had no wear on it. So it had to be a new shoe because there was no RAC, I think the randomly acquired characteristics that you get, you know, when you step on things. I won't show you the bottom of my shoe. But um, it didn't have any of those. And it was very pristine shoe prints, which you don't get if the shoe's been worn a while because the thing, you know, the parts of the shoe and the sole, the texture that makes the prints gets worn off. Um, so we knew all that. And here we have them buying these shoes on April 7th, two weeks prior to the homicides. Angela goes in and buys these shoes. We have the receipt. Special Agent Jenkins goes to a Walmart, pulls up the SKU on that, 
ding, 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 match, exactly the same shoe. Uh, again, a size 10 and a half and a size 11. So we know that they are in there. Um, now, couple that with Angela's statement at the border, which you got to hear. Um, is that true? Maybe not. <laughs> I can't remember now. Um, but she was questioned about her statement there, and she indicated that she um, had bought the shoes for her boys. Jackie. Now, she claims. You may proceed again. Ladies and gentlemen, this is argument of counsel. Equal opportunity. Um, she said that she bought the shoes for her boys and that she threw them away the same day because they didn't like them because they were the type of shoes that Papa would wear. When I asked her who Papa was, she indicated it was uh, Bob Wagner, who is Billy's dad. So we know now that that's our circumstantial evidence before we ever get to the direct evidence of Jake and Angela and what they say about the shoes, right? We have Angela Wagner buying two pairs of shoes, she says for her two boys, and um, we know that both of those shoes are in the crime scenes on the night of the homicides. Pretty strong circumstantial evidence. The next pieces of circumstantial evidence that we get are the ballistic evidence, right? So we do a search warrant out at Peterson Road on the day that they vacate the premises to go to Alaska for a couple weeks or a week um, while they're scoping it out. And we find shell casings, cartridge casings in the driveway at 260 Peterson Road. And they match the cartridge casings that were left behind in scene two, where Frankie and Hannah Hazel are, and scene three, where Dana and Hannah Mae and little Chris are. It's a positive match, meaning it's the exact same gun. Fired the uh, cartridges that we found at Peterson Road are the same, is, was the same gun that killed uh, Hannah Hazel, Frankie, Dana, and Hannah Mae and Little Chris. Again, very strong circumstantial evidence. We went back a few days later and did another search where we got even more shell casings. Um, I think he stopped at 12 um, as far as making positive matches because at some point you don't need to do any more. And it's, it's more than just a field you know, match, right? It's under a microscope and going through the process required in that. So again, very strong circumstantial evidence. Somebody who either lived there or at least fired a weapon at 260 Peterson Road had the same gun that killed five of our eight victims. And we know that that property is, uh, was deeded to Jake and George, who lived there with their mother. The 1911-22, also very strong circumstantial evidence. Ultimately, you heard Matt White say in July of 2017, which was a couple months after our search at Peterson Road when they found these shell casings, that he finally got a breakthrough and was able to figure out that that weapon that likely caused the tool markings on the um, cartridge cases that were left behind was likely a 1911-22 Walther Colt. And they found that out because the lab, the BCI lab in Bowling Green ran across one of them and the word was out. He, had, he belonged to a lot of organizations and certainly to BCI and was asking for help in finding because it was such a unique marking and he, he felt that that would um, help him a lot. So it wasn't the gun that was used, but it was a gun that was similar enough and after talking to the engineers in Germany, and finding out that that was a unique um, firing pin that caused those um, unique tool markings, um, he concluded that we were looking for a 1911-22. And then in 
And where does that 1911-22 turn up? Well, none other than in Jake Wagner's hand. Um, when we get that Montana laptop, there's iPhone backups from Jake Wagner's phone. And in that backup, there is a picture of this gun on January 31st, 2015, a date you'll remember. And then there's a picture later of it. The gun is just on the floor in the January photo. And then there's a picture of it later, actually in Jake Wagner's hand. So now we have what we believe could be the murder weapon in the hand of one of the Wagners. We also have a gun list. Same, no, not same phone. We got that, that from when uh, Special Agent Scheider took <coughs> Jake Wagner's phone. We saw this gun list on the phone at that time, right? And you'll remember that gun list. It has just a list of weapons. In fact, I think Mr. Parker went over it with uh, the defendant when the defendant was on the stand. And it was a list of who had what guns. Now, you've heard from Jake Wagner that that actually was an inventory of the guns that they owned in January of two or February of 2015 when he first made that gun list. Um, and then I think it was revised a few months later. But we, on that gun list, we had the 1911-22, which again, at that time, we felt was um, the likely uh, type of gun, anyhow. And we had an SKS 762 by 39 listed as belonging to George, the 1911 belonging to Jake on that inventory list. So again, this gun list was also further circumstantial evidence, maybe not quite as strong as our ballistic evidence and our shoe print evidence because those are specific, um, but we had the type of weapons that were likely used in this case listed as belonging to the Wagners. <coughs> and we knew that 762 by 39 was important because you heard from Matt White about the heavier grain um, that that tool ammo um, actually was and that he knew from his initial ballistics review that that was a heavier grain um, bullet that had been used. We also had additional information from Chris Newcomb that George was a Glock guy and that it, Glock guy, that he liked his Glocks, and that he had helped him get a 40 caliber Glock um, um, back during, uh, closer to the homicides, and that he had met, Randa had gone with him, and they had met uh, the guy that they were buying it from at a rest stop. Uh, is, would counsel wish to take a morning break at this time? Sure. Would you take yes, time sir. to do that? <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take our morning uh, break. It's 11 o'clock, so we'll be in, in recess until 11.15. At that time, the, the jury is to assemble the jury room. You'll be brought up to the court, the court personnel. While you're on this recess, do not discuss this case among yourselves or with anyone else. Do not permit this case to be discussed with you or in your presence by anyone. Do not form or express an opinion concerning the case. Do no research at all concerning the case as to the facts or as to the law from you. Any source at all, do not read, view, or listen to any reports or accounts of the case from any source at all, and have no contact with any participants in the case, including parties, counsel, or uh, any uh, witnesses. Uh, with, with that, does counsel have anything further before we recess? All right, we're in recess until 11.15.
Jason Brennan. Yes. Yeah. Maybe seated. The State of Ohio's Council may resume the closing argument. regarding the defendant um, specifically. Um, clearly, the circumstantial evidence of just how controlling they were as a group, um, especially the subset of three that lived on Peterson Road um, in regards to their girlfriends, wives, mother of their children, and um, how obsessed they were about gaining custody of their children. The Facebook hacking that was going on, again, is circumstantial evidence. Um, we discovered that, again, once we got the laptop from Montana. We first found those hundreds of pages during the State Route 41 search. But then when we got the laptop, we found thousands of screenshots. And again, um, that is circumstantial evidence as well. False exculpatory statements are circumstantial evidence. So, and also a strong indicia of guilt. So anytime you're giving a false story about what happened or where you were or what you did or anything, um, that can be indicia of guilt as well. And the false story that we got from every single one of them was that everything was great between Hannah and Jake, right? There were no problems, like a little sister to me, love her with all my heart, loved her like a daughter, all that stuff. Um, couldn't say anything bad about any of the other um, rodents either. And, but then we see the Facebook message from Hannah Mae saying that she won't sign papers ever, they'll have to kill her first. And we know that in four short months later, she and seven members of her family are dead. So it starts that circumstantial evidence, right? We can see that the relationship is not as they're being described, but for some reason they're describing it as great. Um, and specifically, the, the defendant was one of those people. Um, purchases of parts to build a silencer. All along, we thought that a silencer was used in this case just because of the close proximity, especially when uh, you are in scene two with Frankie and Hannah Hazel, and when you are in scene three with uh, Dana and Hannah Mae and little Chris, 
Um, we always believed that there had to have been a silencer used, in particular at those locations, but also potentially um, we knew that the SKS was shot from outside and um, assumed that there was a, a silencer for that too. So here we see we get financial records and then the financial records, the bank accounts re then require you, the follow-up to that is to get subpoenas out to eBay or um, various stores on tactical innovations or whatever where you see them making purchases from and then get the details about those purchases. So we have them buying parts, various parts to build a homemade silencer. And we also have them Googling, um, searching how to do that, a solvent catcher. You heard about that, that the solvent catcher is screwed onto the end of the uh, barrel and it's purportedly to catch cleaning fluid, um, but if you alter it just a little bit, then it becomes a silencer for your gun. Um, they're canned matching responses. Um, again, circumstantial evidence when they're all saying kind of the same things. Um, Billy not returning the phone calls of Chris even though we see Chris Sr. calling Billy's phone repeatedly on the night of homicides and it going to voicemail and him never, and him checking voicemail, but him never calling Chris Sr. back. Um, again, circumstantial evidence that he knew that uh, Chris was deceased. Billy staying there at the house that, for the first time that night, right? Um, the tattoos, um, don't want to belabor this too much, but again, this is circumstantial evidence. At least we would submit that it is circumstantial evidence. Twofold, or maybe threefold. First fold is just the fact that the three boys went to get tattoos together in early June, uh, just a little over a month after the homicides were complete. Um, they, threw, they, they all go together to the Shamrock tattoo place. Um, Jake gets piston, Cummins pistons, but Billy gets a scorpion tattoo on his trigger finger. So right along where you would rest a gun when you are shooting somebody. That in and of itself was, uh, we considered circumstantial evidence because certainly the scorpion represents death and on your trigger finger was suspicious. But then we later couple that with, and uh, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but the Boondocks uh, movie that we see that movie clip being watched on the night of the homicides approximately four hours before Chris and Gary are laying in a pool of their own blood at scene one. So around seven o'clock that evening is when Jake's phone Googles that video clip and of course you already heard from him that um, he watched it and he showed um, his brother as well. and. We knew the theme of that was um, two brothers who do vigilante type killings. Uh, they just kind of select who they believe deserve to die or should die. Um, and there's a religious component to it. And so we knew that much. And we knew that Jake had dyed his hair uh, to look like Norman Reedus, Norman Reedus being the uh, Daryl in The Walking Dead. And uh, one of the brothers in this Boondock Saints movie. And we knew that from Chris Newcomb that he had dyed his hair um, along with George and that Jake specifically said he did it to look like Norman Reedus. Um, and then you've got him watching this video clip. <laughs> um, and then you have this scorpion tattoo uh, which took a while longer to figure out or to, again, what we believe is circumstantial evidence in this case is that at the very end of the second Boondock Saints movie, the dad, in the dad of the two brothers, um, kills his best friend. Um, you heard after uh, Cross, I think Mr. Parker asked, <coughs> Special Agent Scheider, if a Glock was in Boondock Saints, and lo and behold, yes, it was a Glock that um, the father used to kill his best friend in the, in the ending scene um, in Boondock Saints 2. And, before he kills him, though, there is a, they have a discussion about the scorpion and the frog. And I had Special Agent Scheider talk about that. Some of you may have heard this parable before then. <laughs> but, you know, the whole, you shouldn't trust me because that's my nature, right? The frog was too trusting, and he ends up dead. 
um, and the scorpion kills him midstream, even though it also means that he goes down um, because it's his nature. The scorpion can't help himself, and the frog shouldn't have been trusting. So again, is that proof positive? Do we know for sure that that's a fact? We do not know that that's a fact. Nobody has told us that that is a fact. However, again, it does seem suspicious, and we consider it circumstantial evidence, given that they watched the Boondock Saints video clip that night. It is about two brothers and ultimately a father who go out doing these vigilante um, killings. George's tattoo, you heard from the tattoo artist, um, and he indicated that he drew that on George. Um, but you also heard from both George and the tattoo artist that they do look through books ahead of time while they're waiting to get their tattoo. I'm sure much for the ladies in the, on the jury, much like I suppose the hairdresser where you're looking through and getting ideas that you might want the person to try on you. And um, that, that he thought that the skull idea might have come from George, but he couldn't really remember, but that he free-handed it on on George and you know, see if he likes it and then he goes. Again, it seems awfully ironic that there is a skull with crossbones, not just a skull, but a skull with crossbones, which is obviously the universal, say universal sign of death, uh, with an eight ball in it when there are eight victims in this case, and then three aces instead of the traditional four aces that the tattoo artist said. He usually does either four aces or three aces and two aces, the aces and eights, that is the dead man's hand, right? So again, are the three aces, Jake, George, and Billy? You know, again, we found it um, suspicious that that tattoo ends up um, on his arm a little over a month after the homicides happen. Um, circumstantial evidence, again, the way the family functions, just their obsession, their, um, how they let things get carried away as far as um, their suspicions and their reactions to those suspicions. The silencer that we pulled out from the well at Peterson Road is strong circumstantial evidence, right? Um, again, we saw them buying the parts. Now we have a silencer that has all those parts um, that we saw them buying. The mag light, um, the freeze plugs. Um, so the um, adapter, and it was used. And again, now we know that it was a template that misfired and, and didn't work well, and so they resorted to something else. But at the time that we pulled it out of the well, we didn't know that. Um, but that still was extremely strong circumstantial evidence. Again, at the cistern at 260 Peterson Road. And we got information from the Maglite company that that <coughs> Maglite itself, because there's serial numbers, because people do actually use it to make homemade silencers and you register it with ATF using the serial number of Maglite. So that's why Maglites have that serial number for you. Um, and we, got information from the Maglite company that that particular Maglite was manufactured in January of 2016. So we knew, for instance, it wasn't some former owner had been there for years. Um, this was a more recent um, occurrence, and certainly after January of 16, which is we knew um, when they had started making the other purchases. The burned up DVR that we found at their home, right? Again, very highly circumstantial evidence. Why do you buy a DVR in March of 2016, put it up on your home, and then take it down and burn it? Um, before we had the direct testimony of Angela and Jake, uh, that was strong circumstantial evidence, right? That um, they bought a three-year warranty for that item, if you'll recall. So. Um, and we were able to positively match it with the, you know, purchased, we purchased the um, DVR system and compared it to the burned up item. And you guys all were able to see that. And there's photographs of that for you as well, um, demonstrating that it is an exact uh, match. The familiarity that the, the family had with the victims in this case, we know that Jake was in uh, Dana's home 
the week of the homicide, putting up the crib for Kylie. Um, you heard on the video uh, surveillance that he got a tour of that uh, location. And I believe the defendant said he was with uh, Jake one time when he picked up Sophia from that location. But we knew that whoever committed these crimes had to know the family fairly well because we knew that Dana and Hannah and little Chris had just moved into that place uh, 30 days prior. So somebody would have to know them well enough to know that. Kind of ruled out the drug cartel, um, you know, because people that are, you know, just have dealings with one person isn't gonna know the extended family situation. Um, but again, we knew that they had been in each of those homes Jake used to uh, live or you know, stay sometimes with, so, uh, with Hannah um, at the location where Frankie and Hannah Hazel were. Um, and they had been inside of Chris Senior's home as well. Again, the Boondock Saints video clip, um, like, you know, watching that shortly before what we believe to be the time period of the homicides, um, when it is two brothers carrying out those crimes, um, using 1911 22s with silencers on them, uh, homemade silencers, wearing black ski masks, um, you know, other similarities that we had, we saw was one point they're hiding in a container at a warehouse and they come up and they jump out um, and start shooting. Um, and I already talked to you about the father killing his best friend um, at the end of that. Um, so again, we wouldn't have even looked at that or thought about that if that video clip had not been played that night. So um, again, that was strong circumstantial evidence in that we already believed that the 1911-22 was um, used in this offense. Both of them dye in their hair, right? So um, I believe Jake said that it had nothing to do with the homicides. And by that meaning in an effort to dye their hair so that if they lost a hair at the scene, we wouldn't think it was them. Um, it has more to do with the fact that they dyed their hair to look like the brothers in Boondock Saints, right? And specifically, Jake admits that he dyed his hair to look like Norman Reedus. So, Again, they, died, they both dyed their hair um, the week of the homicides. We got that information ahead of time from Chris Newcomb, obviously, that has been since um, confirmed by Jake. Um, the custody documents that they filled out on April the 3rd. Again, these were forged documents. They, they were printed out on April 3rd. You, you will have these, it's uh, CC 295A through C, that's the actual physical exhibit. We brought that, we got that out of State Route 41 uh, in George's truck, in a tub, actually on top, this, you know, there's photographs from that uh, search at State Route 41, and you'll see the plastic tub, you know, it's got a clear lid, and it's got those, uh, actually the Hannah one, right on top. Um, so you will be able to see those. I think we either passed them around or showed them to you and enough that you knew there, it is a raised notary stamp. So it's not like it's a document that was on the computer that they printed off the computer that was already filled out. They printed out a blank one, they filled it out, and then put that notary stamp on it, uh, not noticing that that April 3rd had been spit out by the computer at the bottom of those. And there are three of those, right? Um, there is what I call the, if I die before I wake, I want my child to go to Jake, right? The Hannah Mae um, custody document that uh, she allegedly, you know, they made it look like she filled it out in December of 2014, and why is that an important date? Well, A, because it was Christmas Eve that they put on the document, and arguable or logical that maybe Rita would have been around such that she could have put her signature on that or notarized it. And that was also getting close to the last holiday that, well, it was the last holiday that Hannah spent with them when she was still with Jake because she left him, broke off the relationship in early 2015. So 
they had to make it a time when everything was still good between them. And then likewise for the boys, they have them, they each fill out one of their own, right? So if anything happens to us less than three weeks from now, while we're trying to kill eight people on Union Hill Road and Left Fork Road, if anything happens to one of us, whether we get hurt, killed, arrested, I want to know that my child is secure and will go to Angela, our mom. So they both fill that out. They also both forge those, forgery being defined, and, and we'll go over the charges later, but backdating is forgery. You can't um, fill out a document so that it looks like it was filled out at a time different than when it was actually filled out. So, um, but again, strong circumstantial evidence, right? Why? Are they filling out custody documents in Hannah's name so that if she turns up dead two and a half weeks later, Jake gets custody? Or if something happens to one of them. So again, strong, very strong um, circumstantial evidence. And again, those, those documents were found during the State Route uh, 41 search. The video evidence from their surveillance videos um, from State Route 772 and This was from the Boondock Saints. Oh. Okay, so you will have this map in um, one of your exhibits. This is exhibit X. Um, and this is the map, the red being the crime scenes, which you'll recognize. And keeping in mind that 799 Left Fork Road is not accurate. I think you heard the testimony about how Donald Stone walked to the nearest mailbox because Kenneth did not have one. And so that's how that kind of got memorialized in the wrong way. It's on our diagrams, et cetera, but it's actually 1084 Left Fork Road is where Kenneth um, resided. But the purple um, things on there are where the surveillance um, footage is located. And you will see, and we do have um, a guide, but Again, circumstantially, there's you know two vehicles. That's what we first noticed, the two vehicles that were traveling very close to one another in the early morning hours of April 22nd of 2016. So this is the one where we did the jury view, and we drove the route that Jake said they drove, basically, with, with the caveat that once you go either right on 772 or left on 772, that, just to point this out, once you go either right or left, then there's multiple ways to get down to Left Fork Road. Um, and Jake was not sure which uh, route they took um, after that point. But you can see um, this actually also corroborates Jake's testimony in the fact that there initially is that single um, vehicle that you see going down to Left Fork Road. Um, and that's when they go by to check on whether or not Kenneth is there and what's going on down there. And then later you see both vehicles go by and that would be when uh, Jake and Billy are in one vehicle and George is following in the vehicle that they purchased from Uncle Toddy. So, and you'll be able to see that, and like I said, you'll have a, um, a guide that tells you, with, along with the adjustment for the time, because one of them's like 14 minutes time difference, you know, but that is all clearly spelled out. But then you can see them going left the second time, and then they get picked up on the 1475 um, camera. 
um, and keep in mind that George stopped off at the turnaround um, up the road from Kenneth's house on that second trip. So, and then you also see them coming back um, when they're done. So um, you will have that, um, the videos and all that. Um, but again, circumstantial evidence that those vehicles were involved in the crime at the time we saw them because that was you know, basically at, at that hour, the only traffic that we had. But now it corroborates um, Jake's testimony as well. Okay, so let's talk about um, the direct evidence that we have in this case. So the direct evidence, again, is the testimony of people that were present. Um, and, you know, some physical evidence, you know, can fall into that category as well. But we will talk to you about, again, you will get an instruction on how to weigh the testimony of an accomplice. So you will be receiving instructions on how to weigh the testimony of people in general. And you're not to disregard that. You're to use that same thing when weighing the testimony of any witness, whether it's an expert that has additional instructions for you, um, whether it's an accomplice that has additional instructions for you you'll be told you should weigh the defendant's testimony by the same standard. So that standard that you're given, you should still use when, when weighing the testimony of the experts and the and accomplice, in this case, Jake and Angela. Um, but you will have additional ones. And one of those instructions, um, I think I mentioned to you in voir dire too, that um, all of you, I think, said you would want to hear from the other pirates on the ship but that you would go into it with your eyes wide open and you'd want to know that, you know, they're telling you the truth, right? Um, that they don't have any hidden motives or hidden agendas or they're trying to get out from underneath something, whatever the case may be, whatever factors you guys wanted to know. Um, the instruction that you will get, and I think, again, I mentioned this in voir dire, is that you are to regard their testimony with grave suspicion. Um, and that sounds very great. <laughs> um, but again, if you find that you believe them, um, you're also going to have an instruction that one person's word, if believed by you, is sufficient to resolve any disputed fact. So if you believe, and of course that's the if, right, um, then you can convict somebody based on the testimony of the other people that were there and participating with them. Again, otherwise, uh, you know, there aren't any saints on the pirate ships, right? We don't have any other witnesses available to us other than the other people that were participating in these crimes with them. Okay, so let's talk about um, Jake and Angela's testimony. Um, the first thing I would say is obviously Jake Wagner gave us a lot of information, not us here in the courtroom, but us um, during, during you know, his proffer and then uh, led us to some evidence, right? His testimony was corroborated by physical evidence. He led us to the murder weapons, he led us to the weapon that he initially tried to modify, um, ammunition that he didn't even know was in there. Um, all these items in these concrete buckets that we find at the bottom of the lake at Flying W. So we know that he is telling us the truth about something, right? Because this isn't, he can't imagine the buckets into existence, right? He'd been locked up. Um, you heard November 2018 is when they uh, were locked up. You heard that April of 2021 is when he entered his plea of guilty. Um, and so he gave us that information, um, gave us that physical evidence. He also gave us the truck that they used. And keep in mind that um, these are not things we knew about, right? We did not know where the weapons were. We very much wanted to know where the weapons were. We wanted to know where the victim's phones went to. We wanted to know where the DVR systems and trail cams and such went to. We've never, ever been able to find that. Now, you guys have also been to the Flying W. You've been to Peterson Road. 
we're talking, obviously, a flying W, much more vast, um, because that's thousands of acres, but um, even Peterson Road is a big enough property that you could theoretically hide that stuff anywhere, right? So, um, but he gave us the, the physical evidence. Um, he gave us the truck that they used, and we were able to recover that truck from Katie Wagner, the cousin of Jake and George Wagner, and she came in here and she told you what happened. That morning, in the very early morning hours, Billy Wagner comes rolling up um, to their house, unannounced, uh, not expected, and in a hurry, by the way. You know, so before the sun has even risen, before they're out of bed, he's at their house bringing a truck for Katie. Here's this truck for you, Katie. And then expecting Bobby Wagner, his brother, to take him back to Peterson Road, um, which was a, a, a good distance. Um, and was in a hurry, you heard her say, because he said that um, he was going on a trip with Chris Roden. So there's obviously no reason to doubt anything that Katie Wagner had to say to you. She also said she was so excited about finally having a truck or a vehicle that she titled it the same day that she got it. And you will have that title, and um, you will be able to see that it was titled on April 22nd of 2016, which would be the day that she got it, and obviously the morning of the homicide. So again, what Jake had to tell us was corroborated with physical evidence that we didn't know about. It was also corroborated with physical evidence we did know about. So that was helpful to us. Then we talked to Angela Wagner, and she corroborates what Jake Wagner told us. They basically corroborate each other. And the magical and mystical thing about that is, as you heard, she was not provided with her son's statement. She had no idea what he said to us when he sat down with us. She testified that she still does not have that, and that's on purpose. We don't want her to have that. We don't want her to change her testimony or fill in gaps or, you know, borrow memories or try to make it sound the same. Um, we wanted to know from one of the other participants in these homicides, we wanted to know if we could bank on what Jake was telling us, right? And she does completely corroborate. And I don't think we should take that lightly, right? Uh, for instance, you know, she already said that she bought the shoes for Jake and George. Jake says that she bought the shoes for he, he and George, and that he and George wore those shoes that night when they committed the homicides. That he wore the 10 and a half, and his brother wore the 11s. We know that there's a 10 and a half and an 11 in that scene. And Angela tells us, and tells you, that when George and Jake and Billy had to go down and get their feet measured and traced and molds made of their feet, um, she was having a discussion with George afterwards because recall, she felt terrible because at the border she kind of flunked that test, right? They threw the, the receipt at her and the video at her and she, didn't, she wasn't prepared to respond to that. They knew we had metal detectors, they were all you know, prepared to respond to the ballistics. Because um, many people shoot out there, right? But she didn't have an answer ready for the, for the shoot. And she felt bad about that. She told you she felt bad about that. But she says when she's talking to George about it, he says, one of the shoe prints is mine. I wanted to smudge it out before I left, but my dad said, no, come on. Don't, don't worry about it. Come on. That's what she tells us, and that, again, matches what Jake has to say about who wore the shoes and who was in scene one, right, where the bloody shoe print is. 
And that specifically the shoe print they were talking about. That's what had been shown to them was the shoe print that was in the blood. That scene one. So now we know from two different sources who didn't know what anybody had to say about it. And I want you to think about that too. You know, we'll talk about weighing the reasonableness of what people are saying, right? Is it believable what they're saying? Do they have motives to lie to you? Um, Etc. Think back to George's phone call in 2018 when they could feel the, neck, the news tightening around their neck, basically. They knew that arrests were inevitable. And so they were starting to line up attorneys. They were visiting attorneys. They were deciding who was going to hire who, um, how we were going to pay for this, who should get the best attorney. If you'll recall, George wanted Angela to have the best attorney, right? Do you remember that? Because he wanted her to remain free or be the one to beat the case the quickest so that she could take care of the children because she was best suited for taking care of the children. Again, this is all on a, a call um, that George made to Angela in 2018. I believe it was August of 2018. And he says that he wants her to have the best attorney so that she can get out. So armed with that, Angela very easily could have said, I knew nothing about this. I knew nothing about this. I'm going to say whatever I have to say to get myself free from this because that's what my boys even want. George wants me to be free. But that's not what she did. And that's not what Jake did, right? Both Jake and Angela tell you they are guilty. Jake is guilty. Angela is guilty. They don't deny that. They don't lie about that. They don't blame somebody else. They could have all said it was Billy. Billy is the one that's kind of ostracized from them. He's the one that's over here. Um, we could all just say it's Billy or whatever. Or Angela could have assumed that Jake took the full blame. She saw him stand up in court and plead eight counts of aggravated burglary or, or aggravated murder. She heard that he had pled to all the counts in the indictment. So she could have assumed that he took full blame for it and just made up a story that said that. The reason their stories are consistent, the reason their stories match, is because they both finally decided to tell the truth. Right? And we insisted on it as much as you can insist on that, right? I don't want false statements. I don't want, the only thing we are interested in is the truth. Who actually committed these crimes? How did it happen? And you heard, you know, I know that uh, Mr. Parker has called this the deal of the century for Jake Wagner. The deal of the century. But let's just, Talk a little bit about that. First of all, he pled guilty to every count in the indictment except for the death penalty specification, which we dismissed in exchange for him telling us what happened, not just telling us what happened, but you heard from Special Agent Scheider that the victim's family was consulted in this. And as you might imagine, if this was somebody that you loved, you would want to know what happened more than anything. Some of them got the peace of mind they were looking for because their loved one was sleeping. Some of them did not, but they wanted to know. And they wanted us to do the deal so that they could learn what happened and so that we could get physical evidence so that we could hold all four people who committed these crimes and killed their loved ones accountable. It's no good if just one or two of them are held accountable and the other two, if they're involved, escape. That's no good. So armed with that, we sit down with Jake and you heard for a very long time close to 12 hours, over a period of two days, 
First he tells us where the evidence is. We go and get the evidence. Rob reads his story. And again, we, he certainly wasn't telling us what we wanted to hear. We did not know half the stuff he told us, right? We were wrong about the order the victims were killed in. We had no idea about this drug deal ruse. We were constantly perplexed how it was that Chris and Gary were awake when they were killed. Maybe because Kenneth was over, we, uh, coming over to take a shot, we had no idea. Or they thought that's who it was. And they opened the door and that's when things happened. There were a lot of things that we did not know <coughs> that he told us that then made all the pieces make sense, right? So yes, we guard his testimony with grave, decision, grave suspicion. We did, <laughs> we certainly did. We didn't want to be tricked. We didn't want to fall into a trap. You know, they worked together. Maybe they had a plan ahead of time that, you know, Jake was gonna take all the blame or, or they were gonna pin it on Billy or whatever. You know, we didn't want to fall into a trap. We wanted the truth. So we went and we sat with him and we heard basically everything he said to you guys when he testified, unfortunately over a period of four days for you guys. Um, but again, it was his testimony and his statement was corroborated by the evidence we already had and the evidence that we knew nothing <coughs> about, but that we then had and could use regarding anybody else who was involved in this case. Angela Wagner, this is her son. Ask yourself, what motive would she have to say that George was involved? If George wasn't involved, why would you do that to your son? You would say, Jake Billy and I did it, or just Jake did it, Jake and I did it. Whatever you say, why would you say that George was involved if George wasn't involved? The same thing with Jake. Why would you say your brother's involved unless he is involved? And remember Jake, this is really two things about his statement. He told you, and I asked him. He wanted to make sure his statement was recorded because he wanted his family to hear his words. He didn't want us paraphrasing or telling them what he said. He wanted them to hear his words. The other thing that he asked us, and you will have his plea agreement. It's TT1, I think is his plea, guilty plea, and I think TT2 is his defendant's agreement. The defendant's agreement is, look, here's the rules. Here's the rules that we're gonna play by. You're going to be truthful. You're gonna give complete and accurate. You're not gonna hide behind I don't remember or I don't know. You're gonna answer our questions. You're gonna tell the truth. And if you do that, we're going to dismiss the death specifications against you. And because he asked that the death penalty also be dismissed against his family, if he testified truthfully in any of their cases, because he didn't want them getting the death penalty, we agreed to that. Again, after consulting with the family, right? He didn't do this plea to get his family in trouble. It's the opposite. He's trying to get them as much out of trouble as possible. The other thing that he asked us that you will not see in this agreement, not something we agreed to, right? But he asked us if there would be any way for him to be able to see his family one last time, his dad, his mom, his brother, and hug them before they go to prison for the rest of their lives. Now, if you're lying about them being involved, if George is completely innocent, didn't know anything about this, and I'm saying, 
you helped me murder people. Not a stealing fuel offense, but you helped me murder people. Do I expect you to hug me? How ludicrous would that be? Now, I say it's probably a little naive of them to think that they're probably going to have any warm fuzzies anyhow, although I guess maybe his mom, since she decided to also come clean. But, again, some of those things are the telling things that let you know that what they are telling you is true. The fact that their statements are consistent. You know, they were all together when they bought the shoes. She went in there and bought the shoes for them. Um, George helped buy the truck. You know, went and got the money out of the safe to buy this truck. Um, you know, those kinds of things are corroborated between the two of them, even though she didn't go up on the hill, right? The purchases that she was making. Um, for these homicides. Um, all of those corroborate each other. You know, again, getting ahead of myself here a little bit because I'm certainly going to talk about George's testimony, but the differences in their testimony was very stark, right? George and Angela just answered the questions. I got a whole lot of I don't remembers out of George Wagner when he was testifying. Um, even though he could remember things when he was a child in great detail, you know, he could seem to remember what he said at the border to the agents, you know, for a four hour interview, which one would think, you know, again, that's a pretty unique situation that he would remember exactly. And he did remember some things, right? Um, he remembers saying when I was questioning him about the fact that he, uh, called his grandmother a whore, called his four-year-old niece at the time a bitch, called uh, Randa, Tabitha, Beth Ann, um, and I threw in Hannah in there. Because at the border, he had said that he heard that she had turned into a whore. And he remembered that. He remembered saying that. Because that's inconsequential. But he said he didn't remember a whole lot of things that mattered, right? Um, but we'll talk about that. So what did we get from Jake Wagner regarding George, right? We get that George was involved in the purchase of the murder truck, the truck that they used the night of the homicides, sorry. And that George helped him modify it. He helped him build that frame, and you saw our interpretation of that um, contraption. Uh, we based it on what he said under oath, you know, during his testimony. Um, and I think Special Agent Scheider indicated that he went back and looked at the transcript. But, you know, he said he had the two by fours vertical, not horizontal. So we made it, and he even said four inch versus the two inch. And so we did that and put the platform there, uh, the plywood on there, just as he said, and he said he screwed it in. Um, so that's what we did. Um, but he said that George helped him with that because he needed help with that and then also helped him put either the straw or the hay on top of it. He still doesn't know which it was, straw or hay, that night. Um, he indicated to you that um, George was, quote, always the SKS guy Jake was the 1911-22, and his dad was the 40 Glock. That's, that's who had which weapons. He indicated to you that a few days before the homicides that uh, Billy told George that he wanted George to shoot Chris in the head from a distance so that Chris Sr. would not know what was happening, so that he would be killed instantly and never know what happened and certainly not know that Billy was participating in this crime against him. We know that George was present when the shoes were bought. We know that George wore the shoes the night of the homicides. We know that George also wore ski masks. They had the black ski masks, the kind that you just saw inadvertently, I think, uh, on the 
you know, in Boondock Saints. Um, uh, we know that they had on uh, dark clothing and that he crawled into the back of that truck with Jake. And they had their weapons back there with them and they went up to the hill. And you'll recall a moment that uh, Jake relayed that on the way up there, Billy stopped the car and opened the gate to the truck just to make sure that everybody was feeling like this is still something we're gonna do, right? And you know that they then proceeded to go up there and that when Jake got out of the vehicle and George got out of the vehicle that George had the SKS and that they both laid under two different trucks and in the prone position and George again was supposed to be the one that shot Chris, um, which again makes sense because the gun, SKS, is listed as belonging to him, first of all. Um, and we now know from Jake that that is an inventory, not a wish list, despite the fact that the, George tried to convince everybody it was a wish list. And we also know that George doesn't like the SKS, right? Or Jake doesn't like the SKS because he had one that jammed on him. He found it unreliable. So just ask yourselves, if you're going to kill people for the first time in your life, presumably, do you take a gun with you that you don't like and that you find unreliable? So again, that makes sense. It, Internally and externally, Jake's statement makes sense that George was the one who had the SKS and was supposed to shoot Chris Sr. that night. You heard testimony from the defendant that Jake has vision problems at night. That's why when they drive together, George drives through the night, right? Um, so again, you're shooting from a distance, not a great distance, but a distance and you've got that oil filter there um, on the end of the SKS, not helping with the vision much. Um, and then Jake tells you that Chris passes up and he gets to the spot where George should have shot and George doesn't shoot. He doesn't know. He doesn't know if uh, George froze. He doesn't know if George couldn't see, didn't have a good line of sight because of that um, oil filter. He doesn't know because he never discussed it with him. But then you heard that Billy came out there and asked what was going on and had uh, Jake take the weapon instead and told him he had one more chance and he was gonna, he heard his dad telling Chris to call his phone to see if he could find his phone, which brought Chris to the door. And then you heard that Jake shot him then. Again, very tight group, you'll see the photographs, um, you know, very tight group of, of shots uh, on that door frame. Um, but then we know that Billy was inside the home. Jake was not inside the home. Jake was doing shooting of his own. He said he heard two shots. You heard from their expert that sometimes you don't hear all the shots that occur. It doesn't even matter. Again, he was firing shots himself, um, and we know that Billy was inside the home and that Chris and Gary end up dead. Then you know that Jake says he gets the keys and goes up to the grow room to start working on getting cameras. You also heard that Billy is frantic. I think Jake described him as having a nervous breakdown. I'm not sure if that was on direct across. But he was very upset because the plan didn't go as it was supposed to, right? It wasn't all nice and neat and tidy. He had to get his hands dirty. He shot his best friend, what he called his best friend. And he hadn't anticipated having to do that. And he did not react well, right? So he's outside, just kill me, just shoot me. 
I just killed my best friend. He's upset. So Jake spends some time calming him down, talking him through it. George is standing there too. Ultimately, Jake goes in and gets the keys from Chris and goes up to the grow room. He says when he comes back down, he goes back into Chris and Gary's home and retrieves a cell phone. And he says at that time, both Gary and Chris's body had been drugged back. He wasn't there. He doesn't know for sure if he did it. But we know that both Jake and George's shoes are inside that. And what else do we know? Well, you heard testimony that Billy, quote, broke his back. Now, George was kind of scoffing at him the other day about that. But that was before January of 2016, because it was when they still owned their truck, that truck and trailer that they got from Bernie Brown that burnt, and that was the end of their, their cattle business. But that, he was gone by himself and, and apparently got squished up you know, against a wall and claimed that he broke his back. We at least know that the defendant can beat him up, right? Because he bragged about that. He was pretty proud of himself about that. So, and we also know that the defendant ironically uses the same term to describe, uh, Jake uses the same term to describe the defendant as the defendant used to describe Kenneth, which is he's as strong as a bulldog. So we know that George is a strong guy. He considers himself stout, is what he said. So, at you know, lifted an engine block, maybe not out of the car, but onto a trailer or something, he said. So think, of, think to yourself, what is the logical answer here? Again, it's kind of like that SKS. Billy, who has a broken back, who is obviously not as strong as George, and who was just a frantic mess over killing his best friend, do you think he's the likely choice to then drag Gary and Chris's body? back to the back room. Again, it doesn't, in the end, it doesn't much matter. We know that George went into that room, and we know that he stepped into blood, and we see it on our diagrams um, exactly where that was. Then we know he went, they went to Frankie's, locked, will come back, they go past Dana's, Dana's, Dana is not home yet from work. They know that she's working late. They go down to Left Fork, see what's going on down there. They come back and park back at Chris's. They are in Chris's truck at this point. Um, Jake was not a part of that decision. So either George or Billy or the two of them together made that decision. And it's a smart decision from the aspect of if Kenneth sees you pulling up, he thinks it's his brother Chris. If Dana sees that vehicle pulling up, she thinks it's Chris. So there's no alarms that go off before they can make entry into the home. So then they walk back down to Frankie's. And this time, they try the back door. Jake tells you that he breaks his knife off in that door. Now, you're going to see the concrete buckets, and you're going to see the knife, and I think I even showed it to him. And he said, yeah, that's the knife, but the tip's not broken off, is it? At which point I showed him the damage, and again, you'll have these exhibits. The damage to Frankie's door where the metal was part. So I don't know. I don't know if like part of the metal to the door broke off, and that's what he heard, or that's what he saw, and he thought it was the knife. I have no idea. But then he makes entry through that back window. And he says he hands his gun to his dad, slithers in to that house, first goes check on Frankie and Hannah Hazel, and then goes, opens the door to let his dad and his brother in. Now he told you that he's not sure if his brother came all the way in or if he just stood on that back porch. But he goes back to Frankie's room and shoots both Frankie and Hazel. And then he starts looking for their phones, which he doesn't find. He doesn't pick up the rounds at that 
residents because he believes that it's too messy and he's not going to be able to find them. And he also told you that he did not think you could do ballistic comparisons on the rimfire shell cases. So he had some comfort in that thinking that we couldn't compare even if we did recover anything. And then he tells you that his father fired additional shots. And then they exit the, the home. And he took great care to lock the back door so that Brentley wouldn't get out. And then they go back to the truck that was at Chris's at that point, and they get into the truck. And they go to Dana's house. And allegedly the door is open, they walk in, they were prepared to pick the lock if they needed to, but they said they didn't need to, or Jake said they didn't need to. And they go into that home, and once again, you will see the size 11 shoe print in that home, so we know that George was in that home. And Jake tells us that, by the way, after he was done shooting Chris, and we know that he shot six rounds, because that's the number of projectiles that are recovered at that uh, location. And he said at that time he gave the SKS back to his brother. And he says that his brother had that SKS when he was inside scene three with Dana and Hannah and little Chris. And he says at some point, uh, George is behind him and facing, he's by the door and facing little Chris's room. And he also says that while he was back killing Dana and Hannah Mae, that his dad was in the kitchen area and George, he believed to be in that living room area such that if anybody came out of little Chris's room, that he would be prepared to deal with that. He told you about how he killed both Dana and Hannah, that at some point he was in between that area. Um, I know what else I was going to say. When you are looking at the Again, the shoe evidence, um, and you'll probably remember this because we specifically asked um, Ms. Elliott, um, and this is V21, but it can be used in conjunction with um, the other photographs from the scene, but she testified that the shoe print was facing towards little Chris's room by the front door is where this shoe print was in the direction it was facing. So, and that was the size 11, again, left shoe um, print that was left there. So again, Jake's information continues to be corroborated. Um, that was something that came out in trial. That's not something, you know, that he's making a statement around, right? You know, that information of the direction of the shoe. Um, was at that point unknown. So he talked to you about how he killed both Dana and Hannah, that Hannah or Dana was on her um, phone. He could see that she was and later discovered she was on Facebook. And that he kind of froze until Kylie started crying and he saw Hannah raise up as if she was going to nurse her baby. And at that point, he took two steps into Dana's room. She saw him and gasped, and he shot her one or two times. He couldn't remember. And then he walked back and did the same thing to Hannah Mae, who also turned and saw him and made an audible sound. He told you he then went to little Chris's room, 
well, actually, he said he came out of the, Dana's bedroom, he went back into Dana's room and shot her some more because she was making noises. And when he opened her door and you saw in the You can go into Dana's room two ways. So he had stepped in through here up top, but when he exited, it was out here through the kitchen. And when he opened the door to exit, uh, he said that his dad was standing there with this 40 Glock. Um, he was staring down the barrel of his, the, his dad's 40 Glock. Again, dad prepared in case anything goes south to do whatever he had to do if somebody came out of that room armed or otherwise. He said George was right behind his dad at that time as well. He went into little Chris's room, shot him in the back of the head repeatedly. Chris was most likely asleep. And then he went about... Um, picking up shell casings and gathering phones and phone cords and such. And then they exited that residence. Went back, uh, got in the truck, went back to Chris Sr.'s where they got the truck that they had bought from Uncle Todd. They drove down to Left Fork Road and you heard Jake's testimony that George stayed at that pull-off and he and his dad who were in the same vehicle, drove up, just drove right up to Kenneth's, and his dad got out of the vehicle and entered the residence, and he said he saw a flash, and his dad came back out, and then they went about doing what they had done at all the other locations, which is to gather any surveillance cameras or um, other items that they could find. And then he went back, to drove past where George was, and he said he thought his dad signaled to his brother, and his brother followed him back up to Chris Sr.'s, and then they all piled into the truck that they had bought from Uncle Todd, and went back to Peterson Road. And then Jake tells you that at that, once they were back, uh, they drove back up to the barn, which is where the truck had been parked, because they were keeping it out of view so people didn't see it, and he set about destroying the physical evidence, right? Burning the clothing, anything that could be burned was burned. Said he ran out of fuel with his torch um, and tried to cut some of the objects up, tried to destroy the firing pins, other things that would be helpful to investigations um, in trying to do ballistics, etc. And that he then dug a hole, or that actually George helped him dig a hole in the barn uh, near one of the posts so that they could bury the property or that property temporarily until they could get it out and, and further uh, dispose of it. And then he talks to you about, you know, going off to do something and being called back to the home and, um, you know, finding out what had happened and what he did throughout his day. And he also talked to you then about everything that happened after that, right? All the, all the paranoia that they had. You know, I haven't obviously gotten to Angela's statement yet, but Angela talks about um, Billy talking to Jake and George and her one time out by a fence saying, you know, are you sure you guys want to do this? You need to understand that once you do this, your lives will be changed forever. You have to be very careful about where you're talking, who you're talking to, you know, no cell phones in the same room when you talk, put the cover over the TV, uh, run water or whatever um, when you're talking. Very, very paranoid about being detected or being overheard heard by people investigating the case, right? So they all believed that, right? They all believed that they could be being listened to. And turns out 
later, they were being listened to, right? So, um, but the efforts that they went to, to try to throw the recordings so that we thought that they didn't do this, right? You know, like with the gun list, right? The gun list, is, the gun list is a wish list. We don't really own an SKS or a 1911-22, you know, those sorts of things, right? And we know that both he and George participated in those sorts of things, you know, conversations in the truck, conversations on the phone, etc. cetera. Um, and that up at the border, you know, that the, we were supposed to say that we were all having a family night, we were watching a movie, we were up late, except Jake told you he forgot what the movie was. He told the wrong movie. Um, but they had these canned responses, right? These alibi, I mean, it's an alibi, right? It's an alibi for each other. Um, they were trying to alibi each other. And George was involved in that as well. Um, George told people not to talk to us. You know, told Chris not to talk to us. Don't don't talk to them anymore. Told them they didn't have to res show up on the grand for a grand jury subpoena. Um, you know, and he knew. He knew that Chris Newcomb had told us that he's a Glock guy. That he got a 40 Glock. That probably made George mighty nervous. Um, and we know he was involved in the cover up of the custody documents too, right? Because we have a phone conversation between Angela and Rita. This is a 2017 conversation where she is saying, remember mom, remember George stopped over and told you that we just recently did that in April because the kids wanted it updated and so they just put the old dates on, the original dates on, but that's all on a recording. So we know that George is involved in trying to cover that up too. Um, so again, you know, these things that Jake tells us um, are corroborated. Could I see counsel? Yeah. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a lunch break at this time. Uh, a little bit, maybe a little bit shy of an hour, but uh, 1.30, we'll be processed until 1.30 uh, for lunch. Uh, while you're at lunch break, do not discuss this case among yourselves or with anyone else. Do not permit this case to be discussed with you or in your presence. Do not form or express an opinion concerning the case. Do no research concerning the case at all from any source at all. Uh, do not read, view, or listen to any reports or accounts of the case from any source at all and have no contact with uh, any participants, including parties, counsel, or uh, witnesses. Does counsel decide anything further before we recess until 1.30? No, thank you. And we are in recess until 1.30. Jury assembly. Jury assembly. <laughs>